You probably don't need me to tell you just how great beer is. And here in the UK, we're blessed with innumerable brews of widely varying strength and flavour. If you're as much of a beer fan as me, you're going to love these next three films, which detail some of the traditions and techniques used for turning the raw ingredients into the magnificent drink that is beer. As any beer expert will tell you, one of the critical ingredients of beer which affects the flavour and the taste are the hops. Now hops are a traditional part of the Kentish landscape, as Tony Redsell explains. Mr Pickwick said Kents are hops, cherries, women, and I think all of them are pretty good around here. Um, hops have been a, a part of, feature of Kent for well, for centuries now, I think they first appeared in this, this county in the 16th century. The beer needs hops. For, first of all, in the old days, it would need as, as much for preservative effect as anything else, because after all, a hop is an excellent preservative, but it's aroma and character. My major customers are the traditional brewers, the regional brewers. The, if I'm allowed to say, the, the Shepherd Neams and the Youngs of Wandsworth and the Fullers and uh, you name all of the old English breweries throughout the country that we still have, they're the ones that brew beers with character, beers with flavour, and that is where I, they need uh, the traditional English hop, particularly the East Kent Goldings. We're standing in an East Kent Golding garden here now. This is the clone Early Bird, which was a selection uh, from uh, a variety called Bramling. The, the Golding, which I tend to get a little passionate about, um, is an aroma hop. All of the clones of Goldings were found in East Kent in the latter half of the 19th century. And they tended to get, the, the clones got their name perhaps from the parish that they were grown in, such as Bramling or Rodmersham Golding, or indeed uh, f because perhaps the, um, the man who was growing them applied his name to it, such as the Cobb. That was Mr. Cobb of Sheld, which was growing that. How's it all changed? The materials that we use in the hop garden and the staffing are so different now. Uh, when I started, we were spraying uh, to, for downy mildew, which is a fungus disease, we were spraying with copper sulfate and lime. To kill the aphid, we were using nicotine, which was very nasty. And shortly after that, it changed to uh, something called metasystox, which was the same basic material that they used in the gas chambers during the war. So you can see it was not, a very, not very pleasant materials that we had to use. However, uh, nowadays, of course, uh, the materials are much safer. Uh, we don't have to spray as many times as, as we used to, and the hop garden generally is a much safer place for people to work. <coughs> you can see the strings now um, are continuously strung from hook at the top, hook at the bottom. No longer do we have men walking on stilts through the hop garden, sort of 15 feet off the ground, which again <coughs> was quite dangerous, I suppose, although they didn't seem to fall over. As far as labour's concerned, we pick by machine. Um, our first machine arrived in 1954. I'd just come out of the army and there was the first hop picking machine. I think my last new one I bought in 1964, but I've been cannibalising and rebuilding ever since. Every year in the gardens of Kent, a queen of the hops is chosen from among the thousands who come to enjoy the biggest community holiday of the year. The great army of Londoners who have spent a healthy, happy and profitable three weeks in the country now pack up their belongings and return home. With their departure, a new cycle of hop growing begins. Every year, as soon as the picking is over, the gardens are cleared and there's a general tidy up in preparation for next year's harvest. The stripped vines are cut off, collected into heaps and burnt. During the winter months, 
work continues in the gardens. In this case, a job for experts on stilts, which enable them to move about, inspect and carry out repairs to the high wire framework which supports the strings up which the hops climb. This framework remains in the garden year after year, but a careful annual inspection is necessary to make sure that it will not collapse under the weight of the hops when they're growing. So, all poles are examined and replaced where necessary, worn or broken wires are spliced, and the framework is prepared to carry the weight of a bumper crop. In the early spring, the narrow slips of unploughed earth are dug over by hand to cultivate the ground immediately around the plants, which are known as hills. This is followed by hoeing to open up the hills, whose great roots go down 12 feet or more. Then the old growth is cut back to the crown of the hill. In the nursery, young plants are grown from cuttings to provide hop sets for planting up new gardens and to fill the gaps resulting from the removal of dead or diseased plants in existing gardens. Experiments in cultivation and in the use of pest controls are also carried out in the nursery. About March comes the job of stringing. Women run the strings up over the hooks on the wires and fix them to the screw hooks in the ground by each plant. This operation uses up many miles of string. With their extremely long roots, hops need well feeding. At regular intervals, a top dressing of fertilizer is applied and hoed in round the hill. Only the best shoots or vines of each plant are selected for cultivation. This is known as firsting, the first stage in the cultivation of the young shoots. Those selected are trained up the strings in a clockwise direction. In this, the hop is unlike any other climbing plant, for all others climb anti-clockwise. In the nursery, vigorous young plants are in various stages of growth. These will be ready for planting out in the hop gardens next year. Later comes the seconding, when each string is furnished with its full complement of binds. At a later stage, approximately three feet of lower leaves are stripped off to deter insects from crawling up into the foliage, while at the same time this practice gives greater strength to the leading shoots of the plant. With hoeing and weeding going on all through the spring and summer, weeds have a poor chance in a hop garden. Each group of strings is waistbanded, tied about four feet from the ground to keep the alleys clear for the tractor cultivations. The funnel-shaped appearance of each plant gives the garden its familiar pattern. From the commencement of growth till the crop is harvested, the closest watch must be kept for the many pests and diseases which attack the hop plants, such as a spike, which is the first symptom of a vigorous fungus infection, a wild, stunted growth with black fungus on the underside of the leaf. If not removed, it will quickly affect the whole plant and spread rapidly to others. Spikes are cut away and carefully removed from the garden and burnt to prevent infection from passing on to other plants. Kept free from diseases, a hop garden will flourish for years. 
To combat the pests and plant diseases, the gardens are frequently dusted with powders during the growing season. This type of harrow is adapted for earthing up the roots. Hop gardens are very liable to damage from wind, and where no natural windbreak exists, it's customary to erect hessian screens round the gardens to protect the hops as much as possible from the wind and driving rain. In addition to powder spraying, liquid washes are also used. In some cases, underground pipes supply the solutions to tanks of the spraying machines direct from the central mixing plant. With its tank charged, the machine travels slowly along the alleys and the fine spray reaches every part of the plant. This is called top washing, as the vines have now reached maximum growth some 14 feet from the ground. The familiar hop cone is the matured product of the female plant. Usually, one male is planted to about 120 female plants. The pollen is carried by the wind, not by bees or insects, so the male plants are to be found staggered to a set pattern throughout the garden. The value of the hop is in the golden, powdery resins found in the base of the cone when it is ripe. It is these resins that give the characteristic flavour and preservative properties to our national drink. The date of ripening varies from year to year, so the date of the start of picking can only be decided a few days in advance. It all depends on this, the crushing of the hop cone in the grower's fingers. When he sees the golden powdery globules at the base of the cone and feels the seed set hard, he knows that the long months of hard work and careful cultivation have been successful and that the postcards can be sent off to announce the date of the picking. In the little streets of Stepney, Bow and Bermondsey, the people have been looking forward to the arrival of these postcards for many days. They have earlier been engaged, so they know the cards are coming, but are not sure when. Many of these old campaigners have not missed a picking since they were children. And year after year, the crushing of a hop cone in a Kentish garden has been the signal to begin the traditional exodus to the Garden of England. By road or rail, whole families set off taking with them everything they need to turn a bare hut into a home from home. The dogs, the cats, and the kiddies. And for many of the kiddies, this is their only chance of a country holiday. The open fields and hedgerows, luscious blackberries free for the picking. To many thousands of Londoners, their first glimpse of the countryside was around the hop gardens of Kent. And once again for three glorious weeks, their home worries are forgotten. They are off on their working holiday a holiday to which they have been looking forward ever since they came back last year. So to the hop farm. And it is not long before the lines of empty huts are transformed into busy streets of happy people, bringing that homely touch to the hut they will occupy for the next three weeks or so. Nothing has been forgotten. There's a regular shopping centre too, so there's no need to take time off from hop picking to visit the village store. Here are shops to meet all requirements. They lead an open air life. Fuel for cooking is a bundle of sticks delivered free each day. Hot water is available from a nearby tap. And there are plenty of shower baths, which strangely enough seem to attract the small boys. Here is the lady from Stepney calling on her old friend, the camp overseer, to find out where she and her family will be picking. Hops are gathered by plucking down the whole bind and picking off the cones into bins. Hop pickers are engaged by the bin and paid by the bin. This informal way of working is the most convenient. 
Groups of friends, often a family, can work together, though the size of the picking unit is usually limited. Relatives and friends who come down for a short visit join in the picking. And little fingers can add their contribution until they get tired of it. The bins are emptied by measuring out into pokes, recorded and taken to the oasts for drying. Hop picking is extremely thirsty work, and the canteens are kept busy dispensing cups of tea. The inevitable cuts, scratches and minor mishaps are taken care of by one group of welfare workers. While another group keeps the children amused when they're not busy in the fields. As the days go by, the old hands settle down to the familiar routine and find their fingers have lost none of their cunning. Social life is not forgotten. Frequent excursions bring the hoppers friends who come for a day in the country and to enjoy the novelty of adding their quota of hops to the bin. But the bins never seem to get more than half full before the measurer is round again with his bushel basket to measure the hops. The drying of hops is itself a skilled craft, and a good crop can easily be spoilt on the kiln. The green hops are spread out on a horsehair cloth on the porous floor of the kiln. As they're emptied from the pokes, they must be spread out evenly, so that drying may be as uniform throughout. Hops are dried by hot air passing up through the porous floor. Great care has to be taken to prevent the hops from getting too dry, or the flavor will be spoilt. Yet, if not dried enough, they will not keep. The drying takes some eight to twelve hours, after which the front of the kiln is opened and the dried hops cascade to the cooling floor. It is 450 years since hops were first introduced into England and their flavoring and preservative properties were recognized. Through the centuries, there's been little change in the basic principles of growing, picking and drying, but the methods employed have been gradually improved. This modern oast house is one of the most up-to-date in the country. Hops keep better when well compressed, so they're rammed tightly into the long cylindrical sacks known as pockets, which when full weigh about one and a half hundred weight each. From the time that picking commences until the filled pockets are carted away to the store, time is the most important factor. Should it rain during the picking, more time is needed to dry the hops in the kiln. Yet, one touch of overheating and the crop is spoiled. The continual collection from the bins all the time picking is in progress ensures that as soon as the kiln is cleared of one batch of dried hops, another is ready to be spread on the porous floor for drying. This final time cycle is the last of the complicated processes of hop cultivation and brings many anxious moments to the grower until the last pockets are filled and loaded onto the waiting lorry. Beauty competitions are held in each of the hop gardens all over Kent and from among the winners will be chosen the hop queen for the year. Harvesting completed, the pickers line up for the final payoff. An advantage of being paid by the bin is that only one member of the family or group of pickers need line up to draw the money. The amount is calculated at so much a bushel. Twice a week they can, if they wish, have a sub or something on account. It is a profitable holiday, 
and how the members of the bin share out the money is nobody's business